Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for being here. I have no announcements. I'll go straight to questions. Julie. Thank you. Uh, there's a lot of conflicting information coming out of Algeria today. I'm wondering if you can tell us what the status is of the Americans that have been held hostage. Uh, it is our understanding that there are Americans involved, but I uh, would say a couple of things. One, we condemn in the strongest terms a terrorist attack on BP personnel and facilities in Algeria, and we are closely monitoring the situation. We are in contact with Algerian authorities and our international partners as well as with BP's security office in London. Unfortunately, the best information we have at this time, as I said, indicates that U.S. citizens are among uh, the hostages, but we don't have, uh, at this point, uh, more details to provide to you. Um, we're certainly concerned about reports of loss of life and are seeking clarity from the government of, uh, of Algeria. But at this point, you can't say whether those Americans are alive or dead? Again, I just uh, can only say uh, that we are deeply concerned about any loss of innocent life and are seeking clarity from the government of, of Al, uh, Algeria. The U.S. obviously has helped other countries with uh, hostage rescue missions just last week uh, with the French in Somalia. Did the U.S. offer to assist the Algerians in this mission? Well, I can say that we're in contact with Alger Al Algerian authorities and our international partners. I don't have uh, anything more on that contact uh, for you. I mean, this is a situation, as you know, that involved uh, a BP facility uh, with, uh, a, as we understand it, uh, personnel from uh, a variety of different countries. But in those conversations with the Algerians, has there been discussion about what role the U.S. could play, any offers? Uh, not that I'm aware of, but I just don't have any details to, to provide uh, on those conversations. This is an ongoing situation and we're seeking clarity. And just quickly, on, a, on the President's uh, gun violence proposals from yesterday, he said he would put the full weight of the office uh, behind efforts to push for those measures. And I'm wondering what that actually <coughs> means. Will we see him travel? Will we see him get OFA involved? There was obviously an email from Messina today on this. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, as you saw, that email went out, and I think that the President meant what he said. I don't have a schedule of events for you, a schedule of uh, actions or a, a strategy to lay out to you, but the President absolutely meant what he said, that he is going to put the weight of his office behind this effort. Uh, he also meant what he said when he acknowledged that uh, achieving uh, these proposals uh, will be difficult. Uh, if uh, having an assault weapons ban become law again were easy, it would never have expired. If uh, the variety of other actions that the President proposes we take as a nation uh, were without conflict, uh, we wouldn't be having this discussion. So uh, he's made clear that it requires everyone coming together, including people who have uh, not traditionally uh, supported the idea of taking further action to reduce gun violence or some of these ideas. We've already heard a number of voices both uh, from both uh, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party uh, of individuals who've said they're, they're looking at this problem in a new way because of what happened in Newtown. And that's very important to, a, to this process. It's also very important, as the President said, that the American public speak out, because we, we cannot achieve this uh, if the uh, American people don't demand it. And uh, so, as I think I mentioned earlier in the week, uh, you can fully expect that, as part of this effort, we will continue to try to engage the American people and have their voices heard uh, and their concerns heard uh, and their demands heard when it comes to taking common sense action to reduce gun violence in America. But at this point, no specifics about what that actually is. I don't have any, uh, I mean, again, he just made this announcement yesterday. He has a, a piece of business to take care of on Monday and uh, uh, a whole host of other matters. But this is a priority, as I think he made very clear yesterday, uh, and there will be more to come. Yes, Rogers. Uh Jay, going back to Algeria. Was the Algerian government in touch with the United States before the raid? I can simply say that it's premature to uh, get into these types of questions. You know, right now our priority is determining the status of the Americans involved and gaining a full understanding of what took place. As I said to Julie, this is a fluid situation. We are seeking clarity from uh, the Algerian government about uh, this matter, uh, and obviously we are focused uh, most intently on the status of Americans. Um, you know, we are in conversations with, consultation with the Algerian government, uh, but I just don't have any more details for you. 
I mean, you said that you were in consultations. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious if you were in consultations before the raid. Again, I just don't have any more details for you on that. Uh, this is a fluid situation. I wouldn't want uh, to say something that turned out not to be true, so I'll, uh, I'll leave it at that. What is the U.S. assessment of... Jackie got that. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> what is the U.S. <laughs> assessment of Al-Qaeda's link uh, to this? Uh, we certainly uh, heard reports of uh, people taking responsibility, claims of, making claims of responsibility for this terrorist attack, but we have not been able to uh, thus far confirm those claims. But are, is, that, is that something that the U.S. is involved in in trying to figure that out? Certainly. I mean, as a broad matter, we're, we're obviously very interested in and focused on uh, terrorist groups and terrorist actions in the region and around the world. And so uh, trying to find out who's responsible for something like this is something uh, we are endeavoring to do. Uh, but we just have not. I, I don't have a, uh, information now that allows me to confirm or rebut those reports. You said earlier in the week that the United States would consider providing logistical support <coughs> to France and Mali. How does this development affect that? Uh, well, I'm not sure that it does. I mean, we share the goal, the French goal of denying terrorists in Mali a safe haven, uh, denying terrorists in the region a safe haven. And we'd note that the government of Mali uh, has asked uh, for French support in their fight against AQIM. As you know, the government of France has asked uh, for some additional intelligence and logistics support from the United States. Uh, and as I said the other day, we're considering those requests. We have some unique airlift capability, and we are working with the French to provide them support in moving troops and equipment. Uh, as we've said previously, we are also providing intelligence support. All right, just briefly on one other topic. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that the President has uh, an event on Monday. Can you give us any color about how he's preparing for his speech and any little tidbits about what he might say? I have no preview of his remarks. Uh, the President, I think, is uh, very appreciative of the fact that the American people have given this opportunity to deliver a second inaugural address. Uh, he, as you know, uh, takes very seriously uh, speeches of this kind and is very engaged in the process. Uh, he's working on his remarks, uh, but I don't have any details for you. I think, you know, it's the kind of thing you really want to turn over to him uh, for Monday. Is that John. open coverage on Monday? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, Jay, what, what do you say to the local officials, including the governor of Mississippi, who are suggesting uh, that if you succeed in getting new laws passed, they won't enforce them uh, on the gun issue? Well, I, I didn't see those particular remarks, John. I, you know, there are a variety of actions that the President has proposed. Some of them uh, are executive actions. Uh, some of the most important of them, as the President made clear, ha require congressional action. And uh, I'll leave it to uh, lawyers to sort out, if we are fortunate enough to achieve these pieces of legislation, uh, how, those, how those laws would be enforced. But let's be clear here. There is nothing the President proposed yesterday, yesterday that would result, if enacted, in anyone any law-abiding citizen in America losing a gun. The President made clear yesterday his full support for the Second Amendment and the Second Amendment rights of American citizens. He also made clear that we have an obligation and American citizens, including our most vulnerable, youngest American citizens, have rights too, and we have an obligation to uphold those rights, including uh, the rights of seven-year-olds to live without the fear of being gunned down in their own school. So we as a society need to come together and take common sense actions that do not affect Americans' Second Amendment rights, which the President supports, uh, but do put in place laws and actions that address this problem, that, for example, provide for a system of background checks for those who would purchase weapons that is comprehensive, that does not contain gaping loopholes. Uh, that's something that a vast majority of the American people believe is sensible and they support. Uh, and the President sincerely hopes that 
that support which comes from around the country, that comes from Democrats and Republicans, that comes from NRA members, uh, you know, sportsmen and women, from suburban areas, rural areas, and urban areas, uh, will result in Congress taking appropriate action. So, so what happens to the, by, by some estimates, two million uh, assault-style weapons that, that, that are out there now or more? What, what, what happens to those after a ban? Is this a ban on, on the, the old not, weapons are, this, are, are grandfathered in? Uh, it's a ban yeah, on this, is, this is a ban on further manufacture, on new weapons. So uh, how, how effective can something like that be, given that, the, well, I mean, I mean look, look at the sales that are going on even now. Well, I mean, I, I think the President said that there is no question, that there's no single piece of legislation, no single action that we can take that would eradicate all uh, acts of evil, all acts of violence, uh, that would uh, absolutely prevent uh, every terrible shooting in the future. We know that, and the President is aware of that. But, but we should take actions that reduce the possibility that through the reduction in the possibility of the kinds of things we saw in Newtown and Aurora and Columbine and elsewhere, uh, lives are saved. And uh, we can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good here. We can't let the fact that there will, of course, continue to be gun violence in America prevent us from taking actions to reduce gun violence in America, taking actions to make sure that, you know, we are doing everything we can to live up to our first obligation, which is to protect our children. Uh, there's no single action here that solves this problem. Even this collection of actions won't solve the problem, uh, but it will, uh, he, the President believes, uh, reduce gun violence, and, uh, and that's a worthy goal. So, and with the high capacity magazines, the same thing hold true, uh, that that would just prevent uh, ban the manufacture of new? Equipment. That's my understanding. I think we provided a bunch of uh, fact sheets and stuff yesterday on the details, but that is my understanding. That, that, uh, but I, I, uh, I would uh, encourage you to look at uh, the, the stuff that the policy people put together and provided to you yesterday. And, and then just two questions on how you go about getting this passed out, the obvious uphill battle you, you face in Congress. Uh, one, that the grassroots campaign, uh, you know, Robert Gibbs was suggesting that the uh, that the great campaign apparatus that uh, helped the president win re-election should now be activated uh, <coughs> full force uh, on this. Will it be, and will the president be reaching out personally to uh, that there are 11 Democrats in the Senate mm -hmm. with either an A or a B rating to the NRA? Is he going to be talking individually to each of those uh, Democratic <coughs> senators? I think you can expect the president to be engaged with members of Congress, including uh, Democratic senators. I think, as you saw uh, in the wake of Newtown, the president actually spoke with some Democratic senators uh, about this issue, including Senator uh, Manchin of West Virginia. Uh, those conversations will continue. And uh, I have no specific announcement to make about next steps in, in this effort, uh, but you can be sure that the president will use the power of his office uh, to try to bring about fulfillment of these proposals because he thinks they're the right things to do and he thinks that we as a nation need to move forward and that we can, uh, we can take steps that help reduce gun violence in this country and help protect uh, our children, uh, including uh, our youngest children. Let me move around a little bit. Jackie. Could you just expand a little more on the uh, inaugural on Sunday? I mean, it sounds like it's just going to be just family. Just could you mm -hmm. say exactly who is going to be there? Will, that it will be no advisors, or uh, and and why that is? It's a small room, and you could choose another room. Well, I think it's uh, this is the, you know the official swearing in as called for by the Constitution. Uh, and uh, the Chief Justice will <coughs> swear in the President. Uh, I, I, I gave some details. I think we corrected about the Bible that will be used on Sunday. Uh, it will be family. I'm not, I don't have a list of uh, names for which family members will be there. Uh, there will be a full press pool there, uh, and that's uh, you know, a pretty large group uh, with a lot of equipment, and I'll be there. It'll be more, presumably, than just Mrs. Obama and the daughters and the president? I believe there will be some family members, but I don't have, uh, if I, I'll see if I have, uh, if I can get information on, on which additional members will be there. And then at the dinner or, or um, affair afterwards, who would be involved? 
I'm sorry, at which affair? Uh, on Sunday, after the private swearing in. I'll have to, I'll have to check on that. I'm not sure. You, there's a, a series of events, but I'm not sure which one you're referring to. Well, just the, what, what he will be What's he going to do after he's sworn in? I'll try to find out. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, there have been several news reports about an incident in Syria, December 23rd, six people died from some sort of gas attack. Um, several people on the ground seem to believe that it was a chemical uh, agent. The State Department did a couple of investigations. They couldn't corroborate that. On Tuesday, the White House put out a statement mm -hmm. saying only that it didn't match what you know about mm -hmm. Syrians' chemical weapons program. They didn't say what you think happened that day in a home. So I'm wondering, are you 100% sure that no chemical weapons have been used in Syria? <coughs> The State Department addressed this issue yesterday. One of our diplomatic posts received anecdotal information from a third party regarding an alleged incident in Syria in December. Per normal procedure, this information was relayed to the State Department in Washington. We looked into these allegations at the time we received the information and found no credible evidence to corroborate or confirm that chemical weapons were used. We continue to closely monitor Syria's proliferation sensitive materials and facilities and have been consistent and clear about our red lines regarding chemical weapons in Syria. As the President said, if the Assad regime makes the tragic mistake of using chemical weapons or fails to meet its obligation to secure them, they will be held accountable. In other words, we received third party information, we checked it out and found no credible evidence to corroborate or confirm it. Of course, the problem is that this evidence is unattainable inside homes and use of chemical agents uh, is notoriously hard to verify. Mm -hmm. What is your level of confidence that if Again, we found no credible evidence, uh, and the fact that a third party provided this anecdotal information uh, led to us checking it out uh, appropriately, and we found no credible information that would confirm it. So, my, my question but is, your, your question is, what is your level of confidence that if a chemical we, agent we, was used, that we, you would we, be able to tell? Well, again, I'm not uh, uh, able from here to discuss the procedures by which we uh, evaluate these kinds of things, but I can tell you that we found no credible evidence. Uh, and, uh, you know, we are, we remain, as we have been throughout, uh, vigilant about this issue and uh, very clear with the Assad regime about our red lines. Mr. Take on Algeria, can you just talk about the President's level of involvement in this? I didn't catch that earlier. In terms of, has he been working the phones? Is he being briefed regularly since so many Americans are involved? Um, what is the President's level of engagement? Well, the President's been updated regularly by his national security team on this matter, as you would expect. Uh, I have no other details for you, no calls to read out, but uh, we are, uh, as an administration, in contact with the Algerian government. Uh, and seeking clarity about the events that have been reported. And as you know, there's been uh, a variety of conflicting reports about uh, the events there. So we are uh, in communication with the Algerian government, and the President is being regularly updated. The Secretary of State yesterday spoke to the head of their government, I believe, but there's been no calls between the President and I have no calls of the President to read out to you. Okay. Uh, following on, John, about guns, when the President has traveled on other issues like payroll tax cut or other things to engage the American public, as you say, uh, he's mostly been pressuring Republicans. How, um, you know, as you mentioned, after Newtown, he spoke to Senator Manchin, and at that time, in December, Senator Manchin was suggesting he was open to the idea of an assault weapons ban. Mm -hmm. This past weekend, he seemed to suggest he wasn't. Yesterday, Al Franken, who's a more liberal Democrat, was kind of hesitated about whether he supported the assault weapons ban. Mm -hmm. Today, says he supports the principle of it, not making clear he supports the bill. My question is, you've pressured Republicans before. What is he going to do different this time to convince his fellow Democrats, who are the swing votes here, that this is the right thing to do? Well, he's been very clear about this as recently as yesterday, which he believes uh, we all need to uh, reflect upon the problem, uh, examine our consciences, and decide uh, what the right course of action is, and decide whether or not common sense measures that help protect uh, our most vulnerable citizens, our children, from gun violence uh, are the right thing to do. He firmly believes they are, and he'll be having that conversation with uh, Republicans and Democrats and, and with Americans more broadly. Uh, you know, again, I think that we've seen uh, some change in the atmosphere around this issue since the tragedy in Newtown, uh, and we've seen some uh, 
gun rights supporters who haven't abandoned their support for gun rights, just as the President has not, uh, but who view this issue now in a different way and believe that common sense action uh, is the right way to go. And, and the President hopes to build on that. But he, he made very clear yesterday uh, that he understands that this is a challenge. Uh, it, it, you know, these things aren't law, at least the things that he's proposed Congress pass, because they're hard. If they weren't, they would be law. And uh, he will work with members of both parties uh, to, to, to try to get them passed. Now, but when you repeat today the full weight of the presidency, yesterday I went back to the transcript and the word Hollywood was never used uh, by the president or the vice president in the remarks yesterday. Uh, obviously, gun's a big part here, but why not also take on Hollywood if he's taking on the NRA? If it's the full weight of the presidency, why not take on Well, he's movies? directed as part of the actions he took uh, that the CDC study uh, gun violence and causes of gun violence. I mean, there's a, uh, you know, ignorance is not an acceptable uh, position uh, to adopt, that it's better not to know. We, we need to know, and it's worth studying, and we should embrace the science uh, and, and allow uh, uh, the research to go forward so we can learn more about uh, the effect of violence uh, in the entertainment industry, uh, you know, depicted uh, through entertainment and, and, any, and the impact it may or may not have on society and, and on children. Uh, so that was a very specific item that he did uh, include as part of his package. Uh, and, uh, you know, this, I think generally uh, the proposals the President put forward yesterday were recognized as, 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 as fairly substan substantive and comprehensive, and that's one of them. Very last thing on the debt ceiling. Uh, Republicans like Pat Toomey have suggested that you should prioritize what debts you pay off so that things like Social Security get paid, payments, um, uh, as the President said in his press conference last week, he wants them to be paid. He wants to make mm -hmm. sure people don't lose their benefits. Uh, why not prioritize those payments? I just want to give you a chance to respond to the sure. Republican plan that's out there. Well, well, I mean, there's not a specific plan. There's somebody talking about it. But the uh, let's be real here. Uh, there is no uh, off-ramp. There is no way to mitigate the horrific economic consequences of default. Uh, choosing whether you pay Social Security beneficiaries or combat troops in Afghanistan, or uh, veterans who depend on the VA for benefits, or bondholders, you know, this is, these, are, these, are, these are choices that are about default. And the, the fact is, default is not an acceptable option here. Congress has to simply do its job and pay the bills that they've already racked up, meet the obligations that they have already uh, made and then we continue to debate how we move forward to reduce our deficit in a balanced way, how we move forward to get our uh, health care spending under control and uh, reform our tax system. But we cannot, uh, you know, play chicken with the full faith and credit of the United States. Uh, you know, we have seen in recent days and weeks a number of uh, Republicans and a number of uh, interest groups allied with Republicans make clear their position that flirting with default is a disastrous idea. It is a terrible idea. Uh, and uh, we certainly agree with that. And I think you've seen it now from a number of places. Uh, and. Uh, the President has made clear he's not going to negotiate over raising the debt ceiling. It is an obligation that Congress retains for itself. If it feels it can't handle it, we would uh, happily, as the President said, uh, take that obligation onto the executive uh, branch. But we have to pay our bills. We're the United States of America. We are not uh, a third tier economy that goes month to month or every half year uh, and casting doubt on whether or not we're going to meet our obligations. That's not who we are, Alec uh, Major than Alexis. Uh, as you noted, Jay, the situation in Algeria is very fluid and you are trying to discern fact from fiction. Mm -hmm. Once that process is finished, does the President intend to communicate with the country about what he knows and what has happened? Well, I think uh, I have no scheduling announcements to make uh, on behalf of the President and I think we're focused now on finding out uh, and seeking clarity about what uh, 
the events in Algeria. And once we know uh, more and once we have more that we can uh, convey to you, uh, you know, we'll make assessments based on that. Does the White House believe that there is something at work in Mali, Algeria that is moving or shifting in a way that's maybe catching the American public's attention for the first time? Threat patterns, different areas of conflict, uh, an aggressiveness on Al Qaeda or uh, affiliates that needs perhaps more communication with the American public, a greater sense of what's actually going on here? We here in the White House and throughout the administration are uh, intensely focused on Al Qaeda and its affiliates. I think that uh, that has been made abundantly clear by the actions that we've taken. And uh, that continues to be the case. Uh, we uh, work with our allies to counter the activities of AQIM. Uh, and clearly AQIM and affiliated extremist groups uh, do pose a threat to our interests in that region, even if they have not posed a direct threat to the homeland, uh, like Al Qaeda Central in, Af in Afghanistan and Pakistan or uh, Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, but there, you know, this is something, this is a multi uh, headed beast, if you will, and we uh, are uh, vigorous in our um, efforts to combat organizations like this and work with our allies to do so uh, around the region and the world. On the uh, question of gun legislation, it was made clear to us in the briefing yesterday that the White House will not send a comprehensive bill that contains all of the gun control measures to Capitol Hill. It will defer to, in the case of the assault weapons ban and magazine uh, size, to Senator Feinstein, Senator Schumer on one aspect of it, Senator Gillibrand to another. Mm -hmm. There are some House Democrats who would prefer just the opposite approach, a comprehensive bill, one vote, one package to concentrate the mind of the American public. and to achieve a better legislative result. Can you explain to us the strategic insight the White House has as to why it's better for the White House not to write it and send it up in one comprehensive bill? Well, I'd, I'd answer two ways. One, the, the, some of the legislation that we are talking about here, specifically the legislation that has to do with the assault weapons and with high-capacity ammunition clips, uh, pre-existed. And, and Senator Feinstein has done a lot of work on these issues and uh, is working, and we are working with her, to uh, develop uh, updated legislation that addresses these matters. Uh, and so that we believe that's the appropriate way uh, to go. Um, you know, how this plays out legislatively uh, is obviously hard to know. And I would point you to experts on the Hill about uh, how it will in both the Senate and the House. Our interest is in moving this entire package uh, in a way that is most successful. And we obviously depend in part uh, for our uh, decisions about strategy on our um, allies in Congress and, and how they see uh, the best direction to, to move. It is an organic White House decision not to send up a piece of legislation in drafts in one big package. And I'm just curious. Yeah, we haven't. We, we're, we're not doing that, but we're doing that in, uh, I mean, there, there's a reason here, which is that the assault weapons ban uh, did exist, was on the books for 10 years, including uh, uh, a portion of it that dealt with ammunition clips. Uh, that legislation uh, has been something, the renewal of it is something the President has supported uh, for a long time, and uh, Senator Feinstein is the author of that bill, and we support efforts to uh, update it and move it forward. Does this strategy reflect a fear that if you put everything in there with the assault weapons ban, that could pull it down, and that you have a better chance of achieving some of these other goals if they're adjudicated, if you will, in Congress separately? You know, I, I, I can't speak to that directly. I just know that we uh, are working with Senator Feinstein, working with other senators in uh, in the Senate, and, and we'll work with House members uh, to try to move something forward here. Uh, the reality is, as we've talked about, that uh, none of this is going to be easy. Uh, but but the fact that it's not easy isolation. doesn't mean we shouldn't try. It's not easier in isolation. Well, yeah, I think that's that's uh, a question to about legislative tactics that uh, you know you can address to Congress, members of Congress. Uh, and that I think I've addressed here. We are pursuing a course here that includes the legislation Senator Feinstein is working on, other legislation. You mentioned, you mentioned Senator Schumer, and we will continue to press the entire agenda the President put forward. Ari. Um, I'd like to Sorry, I did say Alexis, and then Ari. So Getting the A's here, then Alexander. Two quick follow-ups on Ed's question. If, if Congress today, since we've already gone over the debt ceiling, if Congress today wanted to legislate on this, I'm confused about. Are they even here? I'm just saying. 
<laughs> in a hypothetical perfect world, if they were going to do this today, I'm not sure I understand what, whether the president has signaled how long a duration he's seeking, what dollar amount for the debt ceiling. How would they act if he's not negotiating and he hasn't suggested what it is he's signed? Look, there is a long tradition here of Congress acting to raise the debt ceiling. This is a power that they've brought, uh, that they've given themselves to do. Right. Right. And, why, why, and the point is, is, without drama and delay, right. a monthly extension is drama, okay? You know, I, so what, you know, <coughs> Congress should simply do its job. It should not, you know, we're not going to negotiate over extending the debt ceiling. But if the President's saying he's willing to, to revisit this within a year, would he like five years? <coughs> I mean, what is he saying? I think the President made clear the other day that he would uh, happily take on the responsibility himself if Congress can't handle it. So uh, the fact is Congress should simply extend the debt ceiling and, and do so in a manner that causes no concern uh, to the economy and to global markets uh, that does not in any way suggest that Washington is about to uh, you know, engage in another process that results in a self-inflicted wound uh, to the economy. So, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of a moot point because it should just be extended in a way that does not raise concern about whether or not the United States of America pays its bills. Okay, another follow-up to what Megan was saying. Legislative strategy on guns. The President uh, obviously tasked Vice President Biden to do this. Is Vice President Biden going to be the White House lobbyist on guns? on the Hill, on, and then secondarily, it's been reported that the President's White House lobbyist, Rob Neighbors, is going to be elevated to be Deputy Chief of Staff. So my question is, do lawmakers and, and staffers, are they going to learn soon who the contact person is for legislative affairs if strategy is so important? Let me take the end of your question first by saying that I have no personnel announcements to make. Uh, secondly, you can fully expect the Vice President to be engaged in this process. It makes sense since he uh, led the effort that produced the recommendations that led to the President's event yesterday and the proposals he put forward. And, and, the, and the Vice President has a long history uh, on these matters. Uh, he was chairman of the Judiciary Committee in the Senate. He uh, you know, was a primary author of the crime bill that, in, uh, that included the assault weapons ban in 1994 uh, and will continue to be engaged in these issues. But I don't have a a roster of individuals who will make up the legislative team, but you can absolutely report with great certainty that the Vice President will be involved. All right. I'd just like to try to take another crack at the inauguration question, <laughs> since this may be the last briefing sure. of the President's first term. He's been so busy those last few weeks with uh, the fiscal cliff and with guns. Have you seen any moments of introspection you could share with us about reaching the end of this momentous term and beginning a new one? Yes. <laughs> that you can share with that you can share. That was the key phrase. Uh, and will this be the last briefing? Group? I'm sorry. When is the uh, important question first? What somebody, is somebody, somebody voted over here and said yes. Uh, I think the president takes uh, obviously this responsibility enormously seriously and. Uh, feels uh, grateful for the opportunity that the American people have given him. He, uh, you know, I'm not, he said, the, I think, in the wake of the election that he didn't get, he didn't seek re-election just to be re-elected. Uh, he believes that we have work to do and he believes that uh, both the agenda he has put forward so far and the agenda he will put forward in the future um, will help this country move forward in a variety of ways. Uh, this is, uh, you know, something he feels very deeply. He, uh, I think it's been reported and I think it's fair to say that uh, the re-election uh, was uh, in, in some ways uh, for all of us here a you know, a humbling experience because it wasn't, it was an assertion by the electorate that said, you know, despite how hard the last four years have been uh, on this country because of the grave economic crisis that uh, we were in when, when the President took office, you know, the steps that we've taken have been the right steps and more work needs to be done. And I know he views it that way. Uh, as far as, you know, all, all I can tell you is, 
uh, the president in general, when he works on a speech, uh, writes in longhand on a yellow pad. And I've seen some yellow pads filled with uh, writing of late around, but I don't have any more details on the speech. Peter. Uh, a couple questions following up first on what you said about weapons. You said this is a ban on further manufacture on future weapons. I'm curious what that means for weapons that already have been manufactured and exist in the stocks of retailers around this country and why that wouldn't motivate manufacturers now to manufacture them in bulk and then store them up if they have the ability to distribute them after. Well, it, it's a fair question. I think the original assault weapons ban was on future uh, manufacture and, and I, you know, I think Senator Feinstein and others can uh, speak with you about the writing of the legislation and the and and some of the reasoning behind behind that again we do not believe that any single measure that congress can turn into law or that the president can take or that even we as a nation can do uh, will eliminate this problem will assure us that there won't be another terrible mass shooting in the future but these actions, if we take them, will, the President believes, reduce the possibility and therefore save lives. And, and that's why they're so important to take. And then following up perhaps on what Ari said a second ago, as opposed to the introspective moments about the past four years in this place, I'm curious the President's thoughts as we now head into this weekend, <laughs> given the fact that four years ago there were approaching two million people expected here, this time maybe 800,000 for the estimates. There were 10 inaugural balls this time just a couple. How does he view this moment differently than he did four years ago as a sort of, you know, milestone moment in his presidency? Well, I'm not, I, I don't really have anything more for you on his uh, perspective. Uh, I think he'll provide that when he speaks on Monday. I would suggest to you that there will be a very good crowd on Monday. And uh, I would point you to pick uh, the, the, the inaugural committee to explain to you that the number of balls uh, does not is not there's not an exact coefficient between the number of people going to the balls, but there was we felt I think and the president felt and the and the committee felt that this was uh, appropriate uh, in terms of the uh, the number of events and the uh, and the participants in them. Yeah. Steve, as a general matter, when the American hostages or in a situation overseas, would the government expect or hope to be informed in advance before some kind of rescue operation or attack on the hostage takers? That's a very clever way of <laughs> asking a question that in, has already been asked. And I just don't have, as relates to the situation in Algeria, I just don't have more information for you at this time. We'll certainly try to get you more information as we have it and as we have it in a way that we believe is uh, verifiable. Mm -hmm. uh, how did the uh, White House interpret President Ahmadinejad's remarks yesterday that uh, he would have to transform the Iranian economy because of the impact of Western sanctions? Does, does that augur any hope for any flexibility in the Iranian position, do you think? I wouldn't look at it that way. I would say that it is another indicator, uh, of which there have been many uh, uh, in recent weeks, months, and, and the past year, that the <coughs> comprehensive international, multinational effort to sanction Iran uh, has been uh, effective in the sense that it has had a profound impact on the Iranian economy and has had an impact because of that on uh, the internal political situation in Iran. Uh, Iran is paying a high price for its refusal to abide by uh, its obligations under United Nations Security Council resolutions and will continue to pay a high price. Uh, there is a different path available to Iran, a path that uh, would allow it to rejoin the community of nations, to uh, alleviate the burdens placed on it by uh, all these sanctions. They simply have to, in a verifiable way, abide by their commitments to forsake their nuclear weapons ambitions and to do so in a way that the United States and, 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 and our broad international consensus here uh, believes is verifiable. Yeah. Donovan, and then, I'm sorry, Brianna. Thanks, Jay. You know, it's like I, you were the right in there with that uh, fluorescent. lovely, yes, fluorescent <laughs> jacket. And 
Um, it's been widely reported that Dennis McDonough will likely be announced as the president's uh, next chief of staff. Uh, is that true? No, I'm just kidding. Not is that true, right but here now. I'm wondering <laughs> how, um, how sensitive is the president to what appearances might look like if his next personnel announcement is a white man instead of a pick who might add my, uh, more diversity to his staff or his cabinet? I think it's impossible to answer that question since uh, I have no information for you today that would uh, allow you to deduce anything about what the next personnel announcement would, will be because uh, I have none today uh, and I wouldn't expect one today. Is it a, de a determining factor as he considers no, I think the, the president is considering a variety of uh, personnel decisions and uh, carefully and will make announcements when uh, he's made the decision. And I think that there's a lot of reporting and has been in the past uh, that uh, is speculative in nature that uh, sometimes proves to be, it's like a, you know, rolling the dice, right? Sometimes you, you know, if you say it's going to be three, it turns out to be three, but often it's not. So the fact that some of that reporting about who's going to have which position or be named to which position turns out to be true, uh, there's a whole bunch of reporting that people forget. Uh, where reporters assert that so-and-so is going to get this job and it turns out not to be the case, and so-and-so gets another job and it turns out not to be the case, which is not to cast aspersions. It's just simply to say uh, the president hasn't made a decision that he's ready to announce on that post uh, or any of the others that he has yet to announce. And when he does, uh, he'll, he'll present them to you. On the broader issue about the makeup of his cabinet and White House staff. I think the President addressed this pretty directly in answer to Jackie just the other day. But is he sensitive to the criticism? Well, I would, I would make your assessment on that by looking at the answer he gave, which is uh, that diversity matters to him. Uh, that is uh, in part why uh, a woman was his chief diplomat. A woman has been his homeland, top homeland security. Uh, cabinet He's official, a woman has been representing, right, but that's in the future, but I'm just saying, I mean, I think his record is pretty, demonstrates the value he places on diversity, and uh, he, I think he made clear that you should wait to uh, make judgments about his personnel decisions uh, and the diversity of them after he's made them and announced them. So then after he makes some more personnel assessments, say like, or p personnel announcements, mm -hmm. say he makes his next one, then I think, he, I think he said the, all of them. So I would, I mean, you, I, you, obviously you're free to make any assessments you want at any time that you want. But, the, but I think his, he was urging folks to sort of stand back and wait until he's made what will be a, 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 another series of announcements uh, because obviously there are some positions to fill. And finally, it's the, uh, the First Lady's birthday today, mm -hmm. I believe. It is. Can you tell us anything about how the President and First Family are celebrating her birthday? I don't want to ruin the surprise. But anything that may have already happened? Uh, I, no, you know, I... He's not waiting until the very end of the day to acknowledge... I, you know, that's, that's, that's a personal thing. I, I, don't, I don't have anything for that on you, on that for you. Uh, seriously, I, I asked, but I don't have anything for you. Donovan. I'm sorry? Outing tonight. Uh, I, I, I don't have anything for you on the president's schedule. Donovan? Thank you. <clears throat> Two quick questions on uh, Monty Teo. Hmm? Have you spoken with the president about it, and, and has he had any thoughts about it? Yeah, I know he's a big sports fan. Mm -hmm. uh, I have not uh, spoken with him. I read the article in question uh, yesterday evening, and um, it was fascinating, but I don't, I don't have anything for you from the president. I mean, I just thought it was a very interesting story, but I just don't, you know, obviously uh, have any comment on it. And then separately, in Algeria, um, Scott, um, on Algeria, uh, Sky News is reporting that U.S. drones, at least one, have been spotted over the area. When you said earlier that we are providing logistical support, does that include drones? I was referring to Mali uh, when I was talking about logistical support to the French effort, which is essentially airlift support. Uh, but I don't, I mean, I just don't have any. US drones over Algeria. I don't have any other details for you on the, on the support we're providing uh, beyond what I said before. Yeah.
Uh, so I'm just wondering. That's whether, important. Yeah. Uh, well, so uh, I just wanted to try to put some meat on the bone. Is there are there <laughs> any specific asks uh, of the mayors or anything specific that he needs to tell them uh, from the administration on uh, on some of these big issues that we're dealing with this week, uh, both guns and the debt ceiling? Well, I think you can expect that the vice president will, in his discussion with mayors, raise the issue that uh, he worked hard on and the president announced yesterday, which is our series of initiatives and proposals that make up the president's uh, plan on uh, to try to reduce gun violence. I think that will be a focus of the conversation. Uh, I don't know that they'll talk about the debt ceiling. I suppose that's possible, but but I think uh, gun violence will be a topic uh, and an appropriate one when the vice president meets with mayors. What are you asking? Support. How? Well, I think. Uh, <coughs> Their congressman and ask sure. Them about their I, I think that the, the, the whole point that the president made and the vice president will make is that we need uh, everybody who believes this is uh, a matter of concern and that needs to be addressed and who supports the common sense measures the president put forward yesterday to speak up. And that includes elected officials at the local level and the state level, as well as at the national level. And it includes uh, average Americans and interest groups and uh, civic groups that are concerned about gun violence and who want to see common sense action taken that that respects and protects our Second Amendment rights, but but uh, it, you know helps prevent those who should not have weapons and and from getting them, from obtaining them, and, and helps uh, prevent uh, you know potential uh, violent actors from obtaining the kinds of weapons that could inflict even you know so much damage. Uh, which is, addresses the, the ammunition clip issue. So uh, he will, I'm sure, be calling on mayors to um, support this effort. And that's, that's just the start of it. Thanks, Jay. Ceiling, just real quick, on the debt ceiling, um, the top administration officials did a call with like dozens of executives the other day, the CEOs and stuff. Uh, and I'm just wondering if you could flush that out a little for us as well. What is it that the administration is looking for the business community and corporate executives to do in terms of exerting pressure on Congress uh, for the debt ceiling. Uh, how much do you think you can count on them and explicitly, like beyond urging members, you know, not to hold it up, what do you actually expect them to do? Speak up uh, about any concern they may have, and this is, applies to anyone who has this concern who's in a position of influence, to speak up about any concern they may have about uh, Congress, in this case Republicans in particular in the House, using uh, flirtation with default as a tactic uh, because the, the implications of that are so profound for our economy. I mean, they, uh, you know, I mentioned this earlier, but uh, here's you know, Honeywell Chairman and CEO David Cody saying, you should not be using the debt limit as a bargaining chip when it comes to how you run the country. You don't put the full faith and credit of the United States at risk. Uh, you know, again, the, the, the Chamber of Commerce said, quote, the Chamber believes we should, not be, we should not risk defaulting and therefore the debt ceiling needs to be raised. That's the Chamber of Commerce. Alan Simpson, co-author of the uh, world-famous Simpson-Bowles plan, says uh, of the uh, proposition that the GOP might use the debt ceiling as a leverage point, he says, I think that would be a grave mistake. I don't think that would solve anything. I think they are going to try it, I hope he's wrong about that, and how far they go, uh, how far they will go with that game of chicken, I have no idea, but I can tell you, you can't, you really can't. This is stuff that we've already indebted ourselves. I mean, if you're a real conservative, a really honest conservative, without hypocrisy, you would not, you would want, rather, to pay your debt. Let me repeat, if you are a real conservative, a really honest conservative, without hypocrisy, you would want to pay your debt. That's Alan Simpson former Republican senator. And that's, you know, the, you know, the number of voices out there making that point, I think, uh, is uh, a positive thing when we talk about the absolute necessity for Congress to do its job, for Republicans in Congress not to play chicken with uh, the full faith and credit of the United States, uh, to raise the debt ceiling without drama, without delay, and then to engage in positive, healthy, constructive discussion and negotiation about how we move forward in reducing our deficit in a balanced way. 
uh, and doing so in a way that it allows the economy to continue to grow so that we're making investments uh, in education and research and development and elsewhere in a, in a way that doesn't ask seniors uh, to bear the burden of deficit reduction entirely you know, in a balanced way. And, and the President is eager to have those negotiations and is eager to uh, compromise in a way that protects his principles, as he has demonstrated uh, in the past. Thanks, guys. Oh, you know what? I do well. Mr. Noller, you're looking a little forlorn. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jay, what prompted um, President Obama to change the license plate on his limousines? For four years, he mm -hmm. didn't use the taxation without representation plates, but Saturday we're here, they'll be putting them on it. Why did he change his mind about that? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. I appreciate it. Uh, President Obama now has lived in the district for four years and has seen firsthand how patently unfair it is for working families in D.C. to work hard, raise children, and pay taxes without having a vote in Congress. Attaching these plates to the presidential vehicles demonstrates the President's commitment to the principle of full representation for the people of the District of Columbia and his willingness to fight for voting rights, home rule, and budget autonomy for the district. That's your answer. Sorry, I gotta go. Thanks.